what are you threatened by? Because that, that I don't... See, here's the thing. The more I'm involved in this, the more the idea of the threat of intelligent design doesn't make sense to me. Because the more I understand what these people are about and so forth, I don't know what it is you're th threatened by. What is it exactly? How would you summarize it? I would say that I'm um, by the way in which the debate is taking place. That what we are presented with is, is two opposing theories. One saying that there's an interventionist deity who steps in at certain moments in chemistry, in biomolecular changes in the evolution of the world, and the other that says that there is no such deity, that this can be a naturalistic process. And this discussion is being brought into the classrooms of our children. The debate is then about whether this is one is a religious theory and one isn't, and it then becomes a war between religion and science. What I see is one good scientific theory and one bad scientific theory, which to me is irrelevant to the question of whether our children need some kind of complex understanding of the relationship between science and religion. So what I would like is for historians and philosophers of science to stop talking about intelligent design at all and talk instead about the way that science is conceived in education. And what I'm, what I'm worried about is that if the question of whether or not intelligent design is scientific or not scientific gets settled, let's say, let's say the intelligent design case wins such that it's agreed that, you know, anything can be taught in the scientific classroom, I'm then worried that a Christian, a Abrahamic, whatever you want to call it, worldview will be forced on my children when those aren't my beliefs. Well, look, I think you should wait for all those, you know, you shouldn't presume all those things are going to happen before they actually happen. That's the first thing, okay? Because you're really kind of extrapolating wildly here, it seems to me. But what do you want to have happen? What was your, what was your goal? Well, my goal is actually to move in the direction we're talking, because I actually think there's a crisis in the future of science, frankly, okay? I, I actually think, you know, there's a, there, in terms of people being motivated for the right reasons to do science, that is disappearing. And as, I th and as I've thought about this more and more, right, if we're not going to accept the theological reason for doing science, we've got to come up with a much better one than it makes money for us, okay? Uh, and, and it works, okay? Because this business of it works is just completely dangerous if left as the final word on science, okay? Uh, and I don't know where you're coming from, frankly, because if you're, try if you're trying to teach kids about science, you're not just trying to teach them a load of facts that happens to be the current state of knowledge. Presumably, you're trying to teach them about some kind of, you know, way of understanding the world, and potentially one that they would want to get involved in, in which case then you do need to talk about motivation. You do need to say, why do people think about these things? Why do they come up with these kinds of ideas? So you don't believe that a humanist tradition has sufficient ethics or values? Humanist tradition is parasitic to... on the theological one. This is the problem. Humanism is basically secular theology, right? Because if you're a Darwinist, you shouldn't be a humanist, right? Because according to Darwinism, right, there is no privilege to human beings. We're just a minor genetic accident, and given the way we've been going, especially with our science, we're bound to kill ourselves. Right? I mean, the confidence that we have in science, right, does not come from a Darwinian perspective. Right? Uh, I mean, uh, no, in fact, that's one of the things, I mean, I had, you know, as I said in, in the talk, I didn't go into the business about Darwin's own views, but Darwin is a complete pessimist about the human condition. Okay, he's a pessimist in all kinds of ways. Um, so, for example, I don't think you can blame Darwin for eugenics, for example, because Darwin didn't have that kind of confidence that we could actually control the gene pool. It wasn't that he was, you know, it wasn't that he was necessarily against our having better human beings. He just thought we'd never figure it out. Okay, and he basically thought that at the end of the day, like all creatures, we come and we go. End of story. And all the rest of it are just delusions. Okay? And you know, what I would like to see, Dar and, I, and this is something I say in, in my writings a lot, Darwin has spent a lot of time trying to explain religion. I'd like them to explain science. Explain science as it's actually happened, the way it's gone, the direction it's gone, the degree of, the, 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 the way in which it's con kind of come to comprehend and sort of totalize over our way of understanding things. Explain that from a Darwinian perspective. It isn't because it works. It puts us in increasingly risky positions, but risky positions that we think we'll always be able to overcome. Okay? Now, where does that confidence come from? It doesn't come from Darwin. Right? We think we're better. We think we're special. And, and of course, the humanists think all this. 
But where do the humanists get this kind of idea from? It can't be from Darwin, because Darwin doesn't give them any grounds for that. You see, the old humanism of the 19th century, right, was never a kind of unalloyed Darwinism. It always had that Lamarckian thing going on. It still had that progressive evolution thing going on, where human beings were kind of the crown of creation, you know, and where evolution is imagined as a teleological project where the species get better and better and better, and the humans are the next stop before God. Okay? But of course, if you're a pure Darwinist, you can get Lamarck out of the picture. There's no grounds for this kind of human self-confidence in Darwinism. Not at all. And, you know, and that's why, you know, I mean, Richard Dawkins is amazing because, you know, he, he, he actually still has a lot of that confidence. He has that kind of old 19th century confidence in humanity and so forth. But I'm wondering, from the standpoint of a strict Darwinian perspective, where does that come from? I can see it coming from a sort of theological perspective. You know, any pro you know, any problem we have, we'll be able to overcome. I mean, I, I, you know, for those of you, if you want to see an interesting kind of transition point, um, as you know, Darwin's theory of natural selection was very much influenced by Thomas Malthus, right? Um, and Thomas Malthus was one of these downer guys. Um, and, um, but the person he was responding to was uh, the Marquis de Condorcet, this sort of French Enlightenment figure, okay, um, who's a big humanist. And his view was, sure, we have problems in the world. There's poverty. He, you know, he's reflecting on all these things in the late 18th century. But the more people we have, the more brains we'll have working on this, and the more likely we'll be able to overcome everything. Just having more human beings, doing more thinking, and more doing will do it. That is not a Darwinian point of view, okay? That is a view that actually kind of privileges the capacity of the human intellect, okay? Uh, and, and again, where does that come from? That, that, that doesn't come from Darwin. 